If you're a medical doctor and you enlist in the military, you might figure there's a lot of things you might do. I mean, by its very nature, the military does things that requires the assistance of a doctor. But strapping yourself into a gizmo called a rocket sled in order to test the, quote, highest known acceleration voluntarily encountered by a human, unquote, or, say, flying in a military jet with the canopy off just to see how much the wind hurts your face, might not be what you expect. In his extraordinary career, Colonel John Paul Stapp, PhD, MD, did a lot of downright crazy things with a single goal in mind, to save lives. It is history that deserves to be remembered. John Stapp was born in Brazil in July 1910 to missionary parents. When he enrolled at Baylor University in 1927, he originally intended to be a writer, but witnessing an accident that killed his two-year-old cousin in 1928 convinced him to become a doctor. He later wrote, It was the first time I'd seen anyone die. I decided right there and then that I wanted to be a doctor as a result. He earned a master's degree in zoology at Baylor, followed by a PhD in biophysics from the University of Texas, and then earned his MD from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities in 1944. After his internship, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Medical Corps, qualifying as a flight surgeon, and in August 1946, the first lieutenant was assigned to the Aero Medical Laboratory at Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio. Stapp's first assignment was flight testing oxygen systems in high-altitude aircraft, an assignment that had him flying many hours in an unpressurized, stripped-down, and modified B-17 at altitudes as high as 45,000 feet. The future of aviation depended upon answering important questions about whether humans could survive and function while flying at very high altitudes. Among many problems was that the crews could suffer from decompression sickness, otherwise known as the bends. While usually associated with depressurization from underwater diving, the condition can also arise from flying at high altitudes in depressurized aircraft, even if the crew were using oxygen. Decompression sickness is the condition arising from dissolved gases coming out of solution into bubbles inside the body on depressurization. The condition could result in extreme pain in the joints, as well as confusion, visual abnormalities, dizziness, headache, and in rare cases, unconsciousness. All of these could result in fatal accidents for pilots. Stapp was able to resolve the problem, discovering that breathing pure oxygen for 30 minutes prior to flying avoided the symptoms. The solutions he developed allowed the next generation of high-altitude aircraft that would eventually aid in the development of pressurized suits, aircraft ejection systems, and equipment and methods for successful high-altitude military parachuting, or HALO. After the successful conclusion of his project in 1947, Stapp was placed in charge of another aeromedical problem, the problem of deceleration. According to Popular Science Magazine in September 2014, Stapp's interest was first peaked when he witnessed ejection seat tests in 1946 at Wright Field. Ejecting from an aircraft, particularly as aircraft technology was allowing greater speeds and altitudes, raised biomedical questions. As Popular Science notes, a pilot bailing out of his aircraft at high speed and high altitude would be hit with a blast of wind and a load of G-forces. In an article published by the U.S. Air Force's Air Education Training Command in December 2019, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Roten of the 846th Test Squadron explains, The need for this kind of work was stark and underappreciated. In the 1950s, one out of every four pilots who ejected from an aircraft was killed in the event. Additionally, many pilots who did not have ejection seats were dying in crashes they should have been able to survive. Martin Voschel of Charles River Analytics noted in a 2004 article in ResearchGate that throughout the Second World War, aircraft engineers and designers decided that humans could survive at a maximum of 18 G. Airplane cockpits then were all designed to withstand 18 G impacts because if the person was already dead, why invest in stronger materials and structural support? But staff noticed from crash records that there were pilots who survived high-speed impacts that would have subjected them to more than 18 Gs and where the assumptions of physics said they should have died. Whereas other pilots were dying in lower magnitude crashes where, at least in theory, they should have survived. Voschel continues, It became Stapp's theory that in many of these cases the pilots probably survived the impact. However, the seats, harnesses, and cockpits around them did not and were the real killers. Stapp was convinced that he could produce a safer set of standards, later writing, One factor is encouraging. There are only two models, male and female, of the human body currently available, with no immediate prospects of a new design. Any finding in this research should provide permanent standards. Stapp chose to conduct his research at a dry lake at Murdoch Army Airfield, now Edwards Air Force Base, in California. 
Nick T. Spark, a contributing editor to Wings and Air Power Magazine, explains, That remote base was about as far as you could get from right field, but a key component was already in place there. A 2,000 foot long rocket sled track, built during World War II for tests of Nazi V-1 buzz bombs. The track had a hydraulic braking system installed that would cause the sled to decelerate very quickly, simulating the G-forces experienced in an airplane crash. While the initial assumption was that all testing would be using a non-human subject, that is, a crash test dummy named Oscar 8-Ball, staff concluded that tests must be done with live subjects, a job for which he volunteered himself. Much like his research in high-altitude aircraft, he chose to be a guinea pig for his own research. The Smithsonian Air and Space Museum explained in August 2018, Few safety guidelines and standards existed as aircraft performance and speed rapidly advanced. Staff wanted to understand human responses to acceleration, deceleration, and wind blasts to improve pilot safety, especially in cases of ejection from disabled aircraft. He pioneered, and put a human face to, the new field of aeromedicine. Explaining his decision to participate in live tasks, Staff wrote, I have the missionary spirit. When asked to do something, I do it. I took my risks for information that will always be a benefit. Risks like that are worthwhile. The sled was accelerated using JTOW, short for Jet Assisted Takeoff Rockets, designed to help overloaded aircraft get in the air. The acceleration and thus deceleration could be varied by the number of JTOW rockets attached to the sled, called G-Wiz. Staff's entry into the National Aviation Hall of Fame explains, The sled, named the G-Wiz and powered by JTOW rockets, glided on a 2,000 foot long track and had a very effective braking system. Staff planned a series of tests on humans and set out to develop a harness to hold them to the sled. First, however, he used a dummy named Oscar 8-Ball to perfect the harness. Finally, after 32 sled runs, he was ready to test it on human beings. It proved, of course, to be a dangerous undertaking. Spark described one of the experiments. At one point, to learn more about what they might be up against, Oscar 8-Ball was sent down the track at 150 miles per hour wearing only a light safety belt. At the end of the run, the brakes locked up, instantly producing 30 Gs. The belt neatly parted, and Oscar, in meek obedience to Newton's second law of motion, sallied forth. He went right through an inch-thick wooden windscreen as if it were paper, left his rubber face behind, and finally came to a halt, 710 feet downrange. Clearly, some damnable forces of physics were at work. While there were other volunteers, Stapp insisted that he be the subject of the most dangerous experiments. As a flight surgeon, he was uniquely prepared to be able to note the physiological effects. A post on the Edwards Air Force Base website described one run. On June 1, 1951, Air Force Air Medical Researcher Major John Stapp was strapped into a rocket sled that was poised on a 2,000-foot deceleration track at North Base. Moments later, 4,000 pounds of rocket thrust blast him down the track and into the braking system, from 88.6 miles per hour to a full stop in 18 feet. For a brief instant, he endured 48 G, with a rate of onset of about 500 G per second. In other words, his body absorbed an impact more than four tons. Prior to Stapp's sled experiments, conventional medical wisdom had maintained that the human body could probably survive no more than 17 to 18 instantaneous. A September 2014 article in Popular Science describes his efforts at Murdoch. By June 8, 1951, volunteers had made 74 runs on the sled. Stapp himself was one of the most frequent riders, fracturing his wrist twice on more violent runs. But the sled at Edwards wasn't enough. He wanted to try faster speeds and more violent decelerations, an opportunity he got when he was transferred from Murdoch to the Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The Holloman High Speed Test Track, or HHSTT, completed in August 1949, was 3,350 feet long, more than 1,300 feet longer than the track at Murdoch. Stapp's obituary, published in the New York Times, described Stapp's experience there. Though he began to let other volunteers take many of the rides, he suffered broken ribs, hemorrhages in one eye, a concussion, an abdominal hernia, a fractured tailbone, and a shattered wrist. But he took his most famous ride on December 10, 1954. For the test that day, Steps 29th, nine JTO rockets accelerated him to 632 miles per hour. Would have been a land speed record, although it's never been recognized by organizations that recognize such records. His ride is considered to be the highest known acceleration voluntarily encountered by a human. A post on the webpage of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base explains, The sled was stopped in 1.4 seconds, subjecting Stapp to 46.2 Gs, equivalent to hitting a brick wall at 50 miles per hour. 
Snap suffered bruising, blisters, and even temporary blindness. He was an instant celebrity, appearing on magazine covers and on television. The Air Combat Command webpage notes, Snap's record-breaking sled run was the final manned run in a series of wind blasts and deceleration tests designed to understand human tolerance to high-speed ejections from aircraft. Aside from the positive publicity the event garnered for the Air Force, it more importantly brought international recognition to Snap's mission to prove the safety of airmen and pilots. As to how Snap felt, the New York Times noted his reaction. How did it feel? It's like being assaulted in the rear by a fast freight train, Dr. Snap said. What did he think about as he listened to the countdown? I said to myself, Paul, it's been a good life. In 1955, Time Magazine called him the fastest man on earth and number one hero of the Air Force, although he did not seem to covet the attention, and in 1984 told a newspaper that the only lasting effects of my experiments are all the lunches and dinners I have to go to. Stapp's work led to a number of life-saving advances, from better strap systems for pilots and parachutists to better ejection seats, to the understanding that the human body better withstands g-forces when facing backwards. Stapp's recommendation that airline seats be installed facing backwards is widely practiced in military transport planes, but has been ignored by civilian airlines. Recognizing that the Air Force lost almost as many airmen to automobile accidents as it did plane crashes, Stapp became an advocate who was instrumental in enacting laws that required seatbelts be installed in automobiles. In May of 1955, he invited a number of experts from the armed services, universities, automobile manufacturers, research laboratories, traffic and safety councils, and medicine to witness a sled demonstration and to participate in discussions on automotive design and safety features. That would be the genesis of the annual Stapp Car Crash Conferences, which continue to this day, and according to their website, are the premier forum for presentation of research in impact biomet mechanics, human injury tolerance, and related fields that advance the knowledge of land vehicle crash injury protection. One surprising result of Stapp's work had to do with an Air Force officer and aeronautical engineer on his team named Edward A. Murphy, Jr. When Murphy accidentally installed some testing equipment backwards, rendering one of their tests useless, Stapp went into a press conference and quoted a previously unknown law called Murphy's Law, which briefly stated means anything that can go wrong will. Now, in the context of what Stapp was talking about, it meant that engineers had to plan for all eventualities, including worst case scenarios, but it's made the popular lexicon, although Murphy himself was said to be annoyed at the way that popular culture has trivialized the concept. In a related note, Stapp created another axiom called Stapp's Law, which states, The universal aptitude for ineptitude makes any human accomplishment an incredible miracle. Later, Stapp was involved in high-altitude balloon experiments, testing human endurance on the edge of space. When NASA needed to pick its first seven astronauts, it used the physical test designed by Stapp to select the Mercury 7. Over his lifetime, Colonel Stapp would receive numerous awards and accolades, but his legacy is really fairly simple, as the newspaper The Day of New London, Connecticut noted in 1984. He dreamed of saving lives, and decades later he's credited with exactly that, saving hundreds of thousands of lives. Colonel John Paul Stapp, once the fastest man on earth, passed away in November of 1999, at the age of 89. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guys, where it's snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.